Hello, my name is Sarah McGregor, and I'm here today with the Morris Art Center to talk about Digital Photography 101. So I work at River Bluff High School in Lexington, South Carolina, and I teach Digital Photography 1 and 2. I've also taught some workshops to adults, so looking forward to talking to y'all about digital photography today. First, I wanna show off some of the cameras that I have, um, and then we'll jump into it. So typically what my students use are Canon. So if you're a Nikon person, sorry, this is a little bit more framed to Canons, but I'll occasionally mention Nikons. Um, so these are two different cameras that my students have. So this is a T6, and then this is a T5. So this T5 has a 50 millimeter lens on this. Um, these are what's called a fixed focal length, so it doesn't rotate. Um, there honestly isn't much of a difference between the T5 to T6. Um, if you get the eye, you'll have that screen that will flip out. Honestly, if you guys look at those mode dials, that's kind of where you see it is it looks a little bit sleeker. The body is a little bit wider. So this is what is called a standard kit lens that will probably come with it if you have one of these beginner DSLR cameras. So this rotates so you can change your focal length. Um, this, and also I always have a lens cap on it, and something I wanted to point out that I would also recommend that you would get for yourself is a filter. Um, this is just a Chiaro uh, 58 millimeter filter. It helps, um, so if I were to have any issues, it would scratch the filter, not the lens itself, so that's a really good thing to purchase. So I'm just kind of going through right now the lens and basic equipment, and then we'll go into how to shoot and take photos. So I really like, the kit lens is really good if you're just a beginner, but I highly recommend to step up and buy a nicer lens um, because it, they call it glass is what photographers call it. And a cool thing about lenses a lot of people don't know is that the body will over time just become outdated. It will run slower, listen to your shutter, you'll hear it if it's working too hard. So, but you can always keep the lens and just buy a new camera body. So never get rid of your lenses unless you're just bored with that lens and wanna try something new. The next one up that I would recommend you buying is that 50 millimeter. Um, it's nicknamed the Nifty 50 in photography. Um, yes, it has that fixed focal length, but we'll talk a little bit more about this. But um, if you are not familiar with manual mode, this might be a little bit you know, harder to understand, but this gives you a better aperture range, which means I can let in more light and I can get a blurrier background. So that's why some people like this, because this one, the standard kit lens only goes to about an F 5.6, which only lets in so much. And the 50 can go up into like the F ones, which is really great if you have low light situations. So I have the 50 millimeter on this. This is the standard 18 to 55. And again, this is the Canon T5 and T6. I believe now they have the T7s. And again, if you purchase that eye, you have that flippable screen. It always comes with a standard Canon um, leash on it in that neck strap. Always keep that neck strap on. That is very, very important. Now, for my own camera, I recently upgraded the last year or two and I bought a newer Canon. So this is a Canon 6D Mark II. Um, I purchased this for myself, and one of the things of note, y'all remember I said your lenses can transfer over. Your standard kit lens will not transfer over to the mark. You're going to have to use another better lens for that. So for myself, I got a 24 to 105. I wanted the versatility of this lens. It has a really nice range. Um, so when I travel, I can get good portrait shots, architecture, landscapes, it's a very versatile lens. Um, so I have this one, it does have the flippable screen, which you should always, whenever you put it in your bag, flip that screen back because you do not want to crack that screen. It's annoying and can be expensive. Some things that are a little bit different, we still have our, um, our mode dial here. We get some different modes than we would on our beginners. Um, our wheels are in sometimes different places to change our settings, but this is really great if you're taking photography very seriously, but it's gonna come with a price. Photography is an expensive hobby. This camera itself was um, starting at a grand. I definitely paid over a grand for this. And then the lens itself, when you buy on top of that, is hundreds of dollars. Like this was at least, I'm trying to remember, like a $500 lens. Um, I do, if you're gonna purchase it yourself, y'all, I like B and H photo video. 
BNH Photo Video has a great used section. I bought this lens used, which means somebody else used it for a little bit. It was still in great condition. They rank the conditions for you, and they also have some good rebates. Um, if you're just starting off, I would highly recommend that y'all just stick with the Canon T7 um, or T6. Little hot tip, y'all always buy a model older because you will save some money that way. I do like the kits that they have on BNH Photo Video because they have the camera, they have a zoom lens, and they also have a camera bag that comes with it. And it's honestly, if you were to do the math, you're gonna save money because just buying the zoom lens and the bag separate from the camera is gonna cost you more money. So go ahead and get that package if you're serious about it. Sometimes I have students that are apprehensive about moving up to other lenses, and then as soon as they use the 75 to 300 uh, millimeter lens, they're like, wow, that zoom lens is a game changer. So if you like birding or nature photography, you want to get yourself a zoom lens. It'll be really nice for some shots like that. So those are just the camera and lenses. Um, I talked about the filter. By the way, a tip that I did not mention yet for that filter, make sure when you buy it, look at your lens. And if you see how that says 58 millimeter, and you're probably thinking, but that's an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. Why is the filter and lens cap a 58 millimeter? It's just, you gotta make sure you get the correct filter and lens cap. So always look on the inside and you'll see that circle with a line through it and it tells you what lens filter um, and lens cap you would need in case you were to lose that. So that's just a tip for that. All right, then one of the other really important things that you need to make sure you purchase are SD cards. Always have more than one. And also I would recommend always having more than one battery because you never know if that battery is gonna die, that SD card fills up, you always want that backup. And my battery is always fully charged in my bag and I always have a clean SD card. Now I can be an SD card hoarder, so I have this series of SD cards, different sizes and different kinds of SD cards. So if you are going to be using one of these DSLR cameras, you wanna just get yourself a standard SD card. I would recommend on the smallest end, get yourself an eight gigabyte. This is a 16 gigabyte. Uh, you could get a two pack, Amazon has for two eight gigabytes. I like a 16. Um, just don't purchase the micro SD card, y'all. The only reason that you would need this is I had a cool Bluetooth lens that only took micro SD. Like this is actually how big the SD card is. And this, yes, you're thinking, oh, but it has this SD card converter. But over time, y'all, those adapters go bad. And I had a student who had a whole shoot on just this, and then the adapter stopped working. And so then she had all these photos on that SD card that she couldn't get off because both stopped working. So really get yourself a nice SD card. If you're ever wondering like, okay, why is this one more than another one? And like, why are they different colors? Typically that means they just record faster on the SD cards. So again, an eight gigabyte or a 16 gigabyte, and certainly you can go for like a 64 or a 32. Those will cost you more money, but sometimes there's deals on those and they can have thousands of photos that they could hold. So if you're going on a big trip, get yourself and splurge for that 3264. So let's jump into a different gear. We're gonna talk about phone photography. Because honestly, y'all, our iPhones and the phones in our pockets are really trying to mimic DSLR cameras. I don't think they're there completely yet. They still need to work on their night photography, yet those newer models have gotten a lot better. And I've noticed, I played with a friend's and it actually had shutter speed um, and it was able to get night photography a lot better. The zoom still, let's be honest y'all, the zoom sucks on phones. You really need to do a DSLR if you're zooming like at all. All right, so um, I just, I don't have like one of the fancier newer iPhones. This is an iPhone 8. Um, so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna um, swipe to the side to get it to access. But I always, y'all, always, always have flash off. Like I have a pet peeve. You could ask my students. I hate flash. Just turn it off. You shouldn't ever have to use it. If you are, please don't. Um, so it is off. I'm on live mode. If you want to turn that off, just tap that to press it off. I like it if things are going to be moving or if I'm even photographing water in a landscape. I like live mode because we can have some fun with long exposure there. So a couple tips with that. I think try to break yourself from the vertical and go horizontal 
to take photos, okay? I think we hold our phones vertically, so it's such a default to take photos that way. But think about it, what am I photographing? Is it a landscape? Go horizontal. Is it a group shot? Go horizontal. If it's you know, a photo of somebody standing and you're they're posing, then go vertical. Or depending on, again, just what that subject is, change that orientation, let's break the vertical and let's go horizontal. Now how to hold it, a lot of people don't think about that, but you wanna make sure, even with the camera I talk about stance, is you wanna make sure the, those arms are in and you're holding it sturdy because then you're gonna get more stable shots. So my arms are supported in and I would do that exact same stance with the camera. With the phone photographs besides stance, you wanna to tap to focus. It will auto wanna do that, but you wanna make sure you tap to do that. Now a hot tip that a lot of people don't know is when you tap to focus, if you go up, I'm changing my exposure, it's getting brighter. And if I go down, it's gonna get darker. So that's a quick way. Yes, you can do some of this in editing, but why not shoot it right so then you don't even have to edit. So those are just some suggestions for that. And then if you were to shoot something, I'm just gonna take a test shot even though nothing's really there. Here, let's try, I'm gonna go like this with my hand. I'm gonna take a test shot in live mode. And then when I go to that photo, I can swipe up and I can actually, a lot of people don't realize all those effects are there. You can have fun with a GIF, but my favorite one to do with waterfalls or anything that's moving or moving water is the long exposure because then it will look like all that water is blurred and that's something that a lot of people only use the, uh, the cameras for. A couple other things I'd recommend you'll play with with your phones is if you are new to photography, go into settings on your camera and turn on the grid. It's, it's just the lines that help you figure out composition, okay? So that's just a quick, a couple tips on the phone photography. Um, for editing, y'all, I really like Snapseed photography. Honestly, that's the only app that you would ever really need. These are some of my apps that I have. Um, hopefully we can see that okay. So I like layout if you like to do collages, but that's Snapseed, it looks like a green leaf. My students really like um, VSEO or Visco. Google Photos is good. If you are a Google person, Google Photos automatically backs up all of your photos and can sort them based on location. So that's a really good one to have if you are a Google person. Uh, Prisma makes things look like paintings. Um, and then Canon, that's because that pairs with my camera. So then that way, Bluetooth, I can actually use my phone as a remote control or download any photos from my camera um, to my phone. And then there's a bunch of other fun extra photography apps, but honestly, y'all, Snapseed is where it's at. It's great uh, for editing. You could even do that on an iPad and it would be really nice and user-friendly and it's completely free. Now I know that y'all, this kind of is pairing with that Dafusky Island photography exhibition that's all black and white, which is certainly great. I would just recommend that um, don't shoot in camera black and white, edit that. And always, after you guys make something black and white, mess with your brightness and contrast. I tell my students, your black and whites um, should have a range of values from black to gray to white. We do not want that medium gray. We want a nice range of values. So always, if you make something black and white, do that first, then add that brightness contrast to get those range of values. All right, so now that we've talked about a little bit of phone, let's jump into some camera uh, photography 101. Before you even turn on, you wanna make sure you insert your SD card. So I went ahead and inserted that. Um, what we do is we just push this battery compartment down and we open it. And then there's that little handy diagram that kind of shows us how to insert that SD card because there's usually like one corner that has a little notch taken out of it. So I kind of like to label my SD card so you'll see that. But what we do is we line it up with how it's gonna go in and we push it in and you'll hear a click. Biggest thing, y'all, is with technology, do not force it. If you feel like it's not right, then it's not. I've had to use tweezers because a student shoved in an SD card the wrong way. So then we push this closed, and again, always make sure that camera's off before we open up that battery compartment. So I already have that lens cap off, and make sure, y'all, another good thing to purchase is a cleaning cloth. You always wanna make sure you have one. Never, ever use a shirt because that fabric can be really rough and you can scratch that filter or that lens, and this filter, y'all, that Chiaro 58 millimeter is just a clear UV filter. It cost me about $10, and it could save me hundreds of dollars, so it scratches, again, that filter, not the lens. 
All right, so a couple things about the camera. You should have, I like to shoot in autofocus. I don't like shooting in manual focus. I only do that if I'm doing things like night photography with light painting, um, or if you know, you're doing video, you're probably in manual focus because that's what you have to use. Now that stabilizer switch should always be on. If we think about the back in the day photography, our cameras always had to be on tripods. The image stabilizer is now built in and it's a game changer for photography because we no longer are tied to that tripod. Um, so this does have the lens strap on. I'm just, I'm not gonna have it on, but if y'all are using it, always keep that on. Um, so those are the side panels. How we take off that lens, y'all, is there's a lens release button right here. We press and we rotate off. If we wanna put it back on or switch lenses, this has a white square or it would have a red dot. So white square to white square, nestles in, clicks to go back. Y'all, if you were ever to take this to a beach, please, please, please put your camera in a plastic grocery bag, close it up, put in your camera bag, go take photos, immediately put it back in that plastic bag, back in the camera bag, because y'all, if you took this to the beach, and I were to rotate this, this has happened before with a student, you could hear the sand in the gears, and oh, that made me so sad. And I had to do some time, like clean it out. So then, well, right here is all of our mode dials. So certainly y'all can use auto modes. I think, you know, read the manual. Every auto mode does something different. So based on what you're photographing, use those auto modes. Never go to that scene intelligent auto. Not to be mean y'all, but it assumes you're stupid. So it's very robotic in that sense. So the, the portrait will blur your background, but flash will pop up. Landscape, everything will be in focus. Close up will blur out your background. Sports is great if you know something's gonna be moving because it will do what's called continuous focus and shooting, which it will take a burst mode series of photos and stay in focus. Uh, this one that's newer that is not on the T5 is a food mode night portrait and video. Now I think start off in your auto modes if you're new, but I really, and no flash is certainly okay to use, especially in museums, but I would love for y'all to eventually move into that bracket, watch some more videos. If you are new, new to it, please use TV shutter priority mode, which means you set the ISO and shutter, but it takes care of aperture. Please never use AV because if you're not listening to your shutter, it's gonna auto choose your shutter speed and it could drop so slow that all your shots are kind of blurry. Then manual is the ultimate mode that you eventually wanna work your way to. It just means you get full control of this camera. It means you get control over your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Again, if those are unfamiliar to y'all, Canon has a lot of great videos that explain uh, in basic terms what each of those are, and Canon can, the, um, the Canada Canon website has a really cool game where you can play to practice your manual mode, but you'll get better photos when you shoot a manual. So then a couple other things about our back is, so this is where some of our extra buttons are. So if we go ahead and turn on our camera, and if I was in full manual mode, this main dial right here will change my shutter speed. If I press and hold that trash can button and rotate the main dial, that's gonna change my aperture. If I press ISO, that is gonna change my ISO. Now something I don't always tell my students is that I actually have moved to manual and ISO auto, and in the menu, you can actually set your ISO range, so the only thing that you have to worry about is your aperture and your shutter speed. Now I do tell them that at the end of the semester, but when they're learning uh, manual mode, I don't tell them that because I want them to learn how to set their ISO first before they go into ISO auto. Auto white balance, I would leave that on, that's that WB button. If you are wondering why your photos maybe look orange or blue, check your white balance, because our eyes naturally adjust to light, whereas like fluorescent would photograph kind of yellow if you've ever noticed that with phone photography or other ones. So that's auto white balance. Um, and then some other things, all right, so AF right here is our focus modes. One shot is one shot focus, I typically stay here and then um, AI focus, never use this one. AI stands for artificial intelligence. It's squirrely and it bounces between these two. AI servo is continuous focus and that is for moving subjects and that's what sports mode automatically turns on. So I'm gonna go back to one shot. So those are some of the other things. If I want flash to pop up, press the flash button and I can pop that up. 
cool thing, y'all, that a lot of people don't know because it's hidden on the back panel. If you press Q for quick selection, go over here and I can actually change the intensity of my flash. I can, I would never know why you would wanna go up, but you could go negative one or even negative two. So it would be one stop or two stops or even the in-between less bright than the auto flash is. So if you do not have those mountable flashes that go on the hot shoe, you can certainly use the pop-up flash and then just kick back the brightness of your flash. And that's a really great tip. Um, so then if I go back and look at my photos, I can press the playback button. And if I press disc for display, I can see some more information about what settings I was in, about my um, how much light I have in here. If you don't like all that, just keep on pressing disc for display to go back. Honestly, y'all, I know this sounds like, ugh, I don't wanna do this, and I'm helping with some of this, y'all, but read your manual because you can know a lot of extra tips. But your image quality is here. Um, you can also change some extra things in here. I'm gonna go over to a couple things. All right, so one of the displays I can turn on grid is the, for me, it's on the fourth red and I can turn on that grid if I'm learning composition. Now, one tip that I wanted to share with y'all, I'm not gonna press okay because I don't want this to happen, is over time, we're gonna build up memory and we could wipe our SD card every single time and keep it clean, but it's gonna leave little traces and eventually you won't get the full memory capacity. So every few months, and if you do this, you better mean it. Format your SD card to wipe it and clean it so you have the full capacity and space. Now I am gonna press that, but I'm gonna press cancel because I have photos on here. That's how much space I have. Like, so I, the yellow is how much photos I have, and then the rest of that is space that I have. I am gonna press cancel, because if I pressed okay, it would delete all of my photos. If I wanted to look at my back screen, I can press that live view and I can see my back screen. This is great if you're doing video, it's gonna to default to this. I typically only use that for certain things. You should always look through that viewfinder eyepiece. Now, if you are using your camera for the first time, you definitely wanna use this viewfinder adjustment dial. And when you look through this viewfinder, half press to focus and rotate this until it appears in focus and clear to your eye. That is really big, because if you wear glasses and take glasses off, that is going to change. Um, so that is one of the things you wanna make sure you do. Now, if I press this button on the right, this is called your AF point selection button. Those are all of my AF points where it's gonna focus. Make sure those are all on orange. We can move it around, but if we press set, it'll go back to normal. It can actually throw off the focus of your camera if for some reason it was weighted to the right only. All right, so those are just some of those other buttons. If I want a continuous shoot, single shootings here, continuous shootings here, press set. I would half press to focus, fully press to take the photo, and then it would take a series of photos, and eventually it will time out because it's like, okay, you gave me a lot of photos to process, like give me a little bit to, to process all of that. But typically, if something's not moving, I will just go into single shooting. Um, so playback's how we view our photos. I've talked some about your back buttons. If you ever want to use a remote control, that's this top one right here, and that's where you would plug that in. Um, any devices that you'd have would go on top here on that hot shoe. Um, one last tip for shooting y'all is that a lot of people don't realize is I would half press to focus on my hand. And then if I don't actually press the shutter button and I were to recompose, it's still gonna stay locked focused on that hand. So again, half press to focus, move around and it's still gonna stay focused on what you want. So kind of you're composing that shot and then you can take that photo when you're ready. Um, so half press to focus is a really great thing to do with that. One other thing, y'all, that's a tripod mount. I would only recommend buying a tripod if you're gonna be doing night photography or you wanna be really stable and you're starting to play with shutter speed, like going really fast or slow. But again, this was more of like the basics of equipment and how to take a photo. Um, we're really not getting to anything else. I think one last thing I wanna talk about is stance for cameras. You would have that lens strap on, hand on the grip, your hand would hover over that shutter button. And then if you have a really big lens, you wanna support it underneath. And then if we go vertical, we just, I always have my trigger finger, the shutter button on top, and this hand is flat out to the side, but it's not in the way of that lens, okay? So this is 
appropriate stance. Remember, hands are in. We don't want the chicken wing arms, as I tell my students. We wanna be in looking through that viewfinder eyepiece. So that's some of the basics. Um, thanks for coming with me. And thanks again to the Morris Art Center for having me to talk to you all about Photography 101. Definitely check out the Defusky Island exhibition. Um, I really love all of those beautiful black and white photographs of Defusky Island um, and hope that inspires y'all to go out and take some photographs. And if you guys have any questions, um, my name is Sarah McGregor, and you can find me on Instagram at southern.nocturns. You can see some of my own nature photographs. You can follow my students. Um, I post their work at RBHS Photo. Um, and you can also feel free to reach out to me on social media if you have any questions about something. Um, thanks again for having me today. And again, my name is Sarah McGregor, and thanks to the Morris Art Center. <laughs>